for many of us, the vampire was an entry-level monster. While we may have been too young to see the films or read the books, these black-caped bloodsuckers were nonetheless ubiquitous in the sometimes shadowy landscape of childhood culture. Played just as often for laughs as chills, Dracula and his bee-fanged pals appeared on our cereal boxes and toy shelves, in our TV shows, cartoons, and of course, our comics. Good evening, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. We begin with a sanguine sampling from the folks over at Gold Key and the occult files of Dr. Spectre. What a cover! It straddles the fine line between mild and freaky, a sort of comfortable scholastic press level of horror tailor-made for younger readers and rainy autumn days. Let's get into it. Our tale begins in a Transylvanian graveyard, where hooded figures ride in a grim procession between the moonlit rows of graves. When their horses will ride no more, the men dismount and begin to dig, unearthing the coffin of Baron Tybor. Removing the stake from the remains, an uncanny transformation occurs. The Baron's body reforms, Seinfeld puffy shirt and all. Stylish. And while the Baron is pleased to be back, he doesn't know any of these clowns. Turns out they're a cult all about vampirism, and they're looking to get in good with the Baron in the hopes that he'll grant them immortality. And they've even brought a snack. In this case, a buxom blonde is the equivalent of putting a nice shiny apple on the teacher's desk. Make a note of that. Cut to the occult manor of Dr. Spectre, where the doc's new secretary, Lakota Rainflower, is checking in with her boss. It appears the doc is deep into his mixology classes. Ah, see how it sizzles, Lakota? Turns out in his spare time, the doc has been tinkering with a cure for vampirism. Hey, at our age, you gotta stay busy, right? The doc patronizes Lakota a bit, then lays out his plan to test his new serum. He doesn't know where there are any active vampires, but he does know where there's a dead one. And that's where our heroes are headed. But that's just weird. Is the doc planning on digging up and reviving Baron Tybor just to test his serum? Because that seems like the height of hubris, and more than a little cruel besides. But hey, to be fair, I'm not one to second guess a medical professional. Pack your bags, kids. We're headed to Transylvania. Soon enough, our heroes are on the scene. They catch a ride with a helpful villager, only he's less helpful and more a vampiric cult member out to protect his master. The dock is knocked out, and Lakota is dragged off to the castle to be Tybor's next meal. And though her Indian blood is inflamed, she's seemingly unable to escape her fate. At the same time, the dock peels himself off the back road he was left on and runs the rest of the way to the castle, which begs the question why they needed a ride there in the first place. But I digress. Back at the castle, the cultists demand Tybor drink a nice tall glass of Lakota soda, but the Baron is uncharacteristically hesitant for a vampire. Getting moody, he turns into a bat to the consternation of the cult members, who are beginning to chafe at being jerked around by this guy. Spectre arrives just as Tybor resumes his human form. 
Fearing the worst, the dog lays into the vampire with a handful of garlic. Understandably, Tybor gets the best of Doc immediately. Might as well hit him with a loaf of crazy bread. Undeterred, Doc gives him a taste of the old crucifix. Instead of fighting back, Tybor inexplicably submits, treating us to an unsolicited origin. Forty years ago, the Baron's brutal three-century reign of terror was finally brought to an end. Since that day, Tybor's spirit has been trapped in hell, suffering the infinite and endless tortures of the damned. Now that he is free, the Baron is determined to leave evil behind, but his curse still compels him to drink the blood of the living. No problem. The Doc has brought his anti-vampire juice, and as always, the first one's free. Spectre and Tybor hold up in a village inn to get well, but their arrival does not go unnoticed. The Doc gives the Baron a shot, and the effects are immediate. No weak-ass Kool-Aid this. Just then the villagers show up and start a fuss, forcing Doc and Tybor to escape the old-fashioned way. They return to Tybor's castle to free Lakota, where there's dissension in the ranks. Some no longer believe in the Baron's prowess after his previous squeamishness, but Tybor himself shows up to call bullshit on that. With all the vampiric panache he can muster, the Baron claims Lakota, but the whole thing is quickly revealed as a charade. It looks as though our heroes are done for, but then the pissed-off villagers show up and the whole thing devolves into a free-for-all. The cultists are revealed to be more townspeople obsessed with the concept of immortality, but they get a pitchfork in their asses for their trouble. Lakota is saved, Baron Tybor is free to start a new non-vampiric life, and Dr. Spectre can file this one. Case closed. Cult of the Vampire is a surprisingly vivid tale from our friends over at the usually staid Gold Key Company. Writer Don Glutz's prose is both concise and engaging, and provides an easily readable tale without going overboard. In contrast, there's some very dark imagery here. The art by Jesse Santos is moody and graceful, with the representations of hell being surprisingly potent for a young reader's comic like this. It appears as though the colorist may have attempted to downplay some of the scene by smothering it in magenta ink, but in a way that just makes it more hellish. Except no substitutes, folks. Our second scarifying offering is from another player not typically associated with horror comics. Once the most prominent and successful company in the medium, Dell is perhaps best known today for its books featuring characters licensed from the likes of Walt Disney, Warner Brothers, and Hanna-Barbera, among dozens of others. And while adapting the creations of others was Dell's bread and butter, the company would occasionally attempt to provide comics that explored original characters as well. Semi-original, anyway. Dell had primed the pump early with its 1960s adaptions of classic novels Dracula and Frankenstein, but the trio of monster titles they would offer in mid-1966 would have more in common with the high-camp Batman TV show popular at the time than gothic horror. And while both Frankenstein and Werewolf, Universal's own the rights to the term Wolfman, are entertaining comics in their own right, this episode we're going to focus on the one and the only, Al Ucard, a.k.a. Dracula. Strap in, because this one sucks harder than teenage me trying to get that last sip out of a Capri Sun. Our tale begins with our hero, the aforementioned Al Ucard, perusing the newsstand. The press is still buzzing about his previous adventure against Maltep's, which is either a supervillain or some kind of mid-1960s diet aid. Al decides he needs a hidden lair or secret hideout to operate out of. Perhaps a cave? Before things can get litigious, we're thrown a curveball. And who is this that knows our hero's secret identity? Eh, it's just some half-wood he was on the boat with last issue. 
Apparently, she calls everybody Dracula because that's the latest thing, according to all the magazines. So wait, if giving people a sharp blow on the back of the head with a garden trowel were the latest thing, would she be out doing that, too? Fads. They're stupid and dangerous, kids. At any rate, it turns out her name is B.B. B.B., and the guy in the bushes? He's the real Dracula. Sadly, this comic stubbornly glosses over the Lord of the Undead in favor of these two servings of lukewarm wallpaper paste instead. Turns out B.B. is a stalker on top of her other winning attributes, and she's been watching Al's apartment. This further drives home the point that Al needs a hidden base, and we're all pretty eager to go with him and find one, but B.B. insists that he come to a party at her father's mountain retreat instead. Al knuckles under immediately. Hey, I reckon even Dracula likes a free lunch. B.B.'s father's palatial estate has a great view of some disused military radar bunkers built into the side of the mountain, which catch Al's attention. Why, that would be a swell secret hideout, whenever the millionaire and his frequent guests weren't looking right at them anyway. Our hero can't wait to go and check them out, but world-class narcissist B.B. demands everyone come and see her learn to skydive first. Man, free lunch or not, I don't think this is worth it. Once his host is mercifully carried away, Al slips off to try and find his way into the radar station. He doesn't get far before he's got to deal with more nonsense. Turns out B.B.'s shoot has failed and she's too paralyzed with fear to open her safety. Wait, didn't the party guests just talk all about how great she was at everything? I guess she's great at failing, too. In spite of the merciful relief her death would bring us all, Al transforms into a bat, saving B.B. in the most unlikely fashion possible. And though everyone was watching the jump this whole time, no one even noticed the guy in the blue seersucker suit pop in and out? These people are morons! B.B. then confronts Al. Instead of insisting she just had too many champagne mimosas for lunch, the big dummy up and admits to everything. And now, he must disappear. Except he's talked right out of it by this total stranger. Somehow B.B. knows he's trying to access the radar base and she can get him in to boot. No, she doesn't have to flash general half-track. There's a big open tunnel that they can just walk right into. This is far too easy, so Al decides to access the base via an underground hatch instead of the opening big enough to drive a truck through. Some folk just need to complicate everything. As the army was nice enough to leave the power on and all the machines free of passwords, Al decides to move right in. Here's a groovy cutaway of his new digs. Hmm. Get Diabolique's interior decorator on the phone. This place needs a room with track lighting and a big spinning bed for sexy money fights. Part 2 is the origin of Fleeto, which sees the Beeb transformed after seemingly consuming one of Don Preston's vile foamy liquids. Hey, it's not so bad. This is the formula Al is working on to stabilize his vampire powers, but before he can perfect it, B.B. calls. She understands that he's a moody vampire hero self-isolating in his bid to further his relentless one-man war on crime, but maybe he'd like to go to the beach this afternoon with her and some children he doesn't know for a picnic. Surprisingly, Al shoots this idea down in spite of B.B. calling him mean. I guess our hero is toughening up. Waiting for B.B. and the kids on the beach is a guy we'll call the Ped Piper, for reasons that should be obvious. His goal is to assemble a child army to do his evil bidding. And here comes a van load of children now. Isn't it great when things go your way? The kids are led by a single girl, and a simple one at that. Boy, he's got your number, sister. The kids are quickly mesmerized, and they go all children of the damned on B.B. and tie her up. With a sentiment that would soon be a punchline to comedians the world over, B.B. wonders, and what of the children? Ah, they'll be fine. You, on the other hand, will be bundled into your van and given a one-way ticket into the briny. Luckily, Al has refined his vampire juice, and he's headed to the beach after all, arriving just in time to save B.B., 
Meanwhile, the Piper and his kids are on a crime spree, robbing small-town gas stations with impunity. Articular character, now sporting his Dracul costume, engages his foe. But how can he stop the Piper from sending the kids marching to their deaths? And more importantly, where does he keep that suit when he's a bat? Actually, I don't want to know, and neither do you. So, hero and villain are at a stalemate here. If only Dracual had a utility belt or a teenager in brightly colored clothing to draw his fire, hell, a handful of sand could solve this problem, but nope. Dracual is powerless to stop the piper. Just then, Bibi shows up and orders the kids to jump off the cliff, seemingly to their deaths. Horrified, but finally motivated to do something, Dracual lays the piper out. And hey, it's okay. It turns out BB hung up a net which caught the falling children, never mind the fact that they were at least 50 feet off the ground and they probably landed on each other. <laughs> I'm sure they're fine. The real head-scratcher here is Drac's mask. Does covering only your nose really hide your identity? There. Did you recognize me? See? I knew it! This guy's modus operandi needs a lot of work. Fortunately, he's about to get help whether he likes it or not, in the form of this blonde nuisance, who takes it upon herself not only to demand she be Drax's partner, but drinks up all his vampire juice as well. Now BB can also turn into a bat, which in itself isn't really all that much to base a career on. Sporting an outfit even more ludicrous than her partner, BB, now known as Fleeta, joins Dracual's battle on crime and sensible face coverings. Dell's new approach didn't win many readers, and the book ended with, well, this issue. Turns out while camp is enjoyable in small doses, it proves to be too rich for some in the long term. The Dell super monsters were left to haunt the dollar boxes of Comic-Cons for decades to come, but in recent years people have started to pick these books up, more as curiosities than anything. Uh, that said, there are still plenty of copies out there, if you're into this sort of thing. Next up, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so the makers of television's The Night Stalker had to be mighty flattered indeed by the debut issue of Atlas Comics' The Cougar. Now, Atlas was never shy about borrowing ideas and inspiration. This issue even makes it a point to uh, mention producer of The Night Stalker Dan Curtis, but it's still mighty thin justification for the lengths that they go to in emulating their source material. Our story starts off with a bang as two figures wrestle atop a moving carriage. It's a vampire and a Van Helsing type in a scene eerily reminiscent of Hammer films, and it turns out there's good reason for this. We're actually on a film set, specifically the gore of Dracula. Director Beckman is dissatisfied with the take, but shooting is called for the night, and the players go their separate ways. The stuntmen and actors, along with our tag-along hero, Jeff, head into town for a drink, while producer Roger treks up to the castle the production is rented for the next day's shoot. It looks like the studio is going to get its money's worth. It's real spooky inside. There's a coffin and everything. Roger being Roger pulls the stake out and, wouldn't you know it, vampire karate chop. It's lights out for Roger, but the party is still going in town. We join Jeff and the kids at the tavern, but we're not the only ones dropping in. Seems the vampire is already up and moving, which is mighty impressive. I always have to take a nap after a big meal like that. The vampire barges in and grabs two scoops of Kathy, mistaking her for his long-lost lady love, Katya. Jeff is thrown aside, so stuntman Harv jumps in to rescue the lovely lady. Alas, Harv's ribs are snapped like dry twigs, but this gives hero Jeff time to get in a harness as the cougar. He flips and kicks a bit, but this is a vampire we're talking about here, and all the gymnastics are pretty ineffective. Fortunately, a cop shows up and quite literally blasts light through the Cape Cadaver. And while we're told the barrage of gunfire is futile, the vampire runs off anyway. Futile or not, I guess you don't want to be walking around with a bunch of silver dollar-sized holes in your cape. 
It just looks bad to the other vampires. The next day, the shoot at the castle begins, but producer Roger is nowhere to be found. This is an issue for some reason, although producers don't traditionally need to be on the set. Kathy remembers he went inside the castle the night before to check things out, so the gang heads over to see what's doing. They find Roger, well, what's left of Roger, pretty quickly. He's dead, and Jeff Le Courier Coogan is going to find out why. Jeff takes a trip to the local bookshop, where he meets up with local Wilfer Brimley imitator here. Bitches don't know about his diabetes or vampirism, so he takes Jeff downstairs to his surprisingly well-stocked occult section. Putting it in the basement was a great choice. The Coog discovers the castle the film is currently shooting in belonged to one Baron Craylock. For those playing along at home, that's two barons per count, which is pretty disproportionate considering what I thought I knew about vampires. Live and learn, huh? Cougar rushes back to Kathy, but Craylock is of the same mind. According to our breathless narrator, a vampire does what a vampire wants and destroys anything that gets in its way, even doors and cougars. Well, okay, he just knocked the cougar out, but still ripping it up. Twenty minutes later, our hero wakes to determine that the Baron has taken Kathy back to his castle so he can do his thing uninterrupted, but does that scan? Are we really expected to believe that vampires need the home field advantage to perform? The cougar shows up just in time, does some kicks, but is more or less useless against his fanged foe. But there's more than one way to kill a vampire. There's two, and Cougar does the other one, stabbing Craylock through the heart with a shard of broken tabletop. Kathy wakes up just in time to miss everything, and the two go home, presumably to have some feelingless shock-induced coitus and a wordless Grand Slam breakfast at Denny's. So yeah, what can you say about an Atlas comic? Some of them are pretty good. Others are like this. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure about the rest of his work, but writer Steve Mitchell's script is flat and uninspired here. Uh, considering this is the Cougar's awesome origin issue, you'd think that we'd get something more motivation for the what the character's all about, at least. I mean, instead, when we meet this guy, he's hanging out on a movie set. He's not the star. He's not the stuntman. He's not even the security guard. He's just a guy in a red leotard who seems to have nothing better to do. Think Spider-Man, if Uncle Ben had lived and Peter had moved into the Parker's basement. But, so as not to end on a complete downer, we're going to look at one more story. It's a short but punchy tale starring everyone's third favorite anthropomorphic mallard, Howard the Duck. It's all the way over here! <laughs> After saving the city from the uncanny menace of Garko, the man-frog, Howard sits alone in an empty jail cell. He's not alone for long, however, as Commissioner Gordansky and hopeless beat cop Thompson come in to shake him down. The commissioner demands Howard remove his clothes. That includes the duck suit this alleged midget is wearing, although when Gordansky tires of demanding and takes matters into his own hands, he discovers the foul truth. After this, Howard is free to go. Gordansky clearly doesn't want word of this getting out to Batmanowitz. Elsewhere, on a farm not far from the city, a farmer discovers a strange cow has wandered into his barn. Being a solid son of the soil, he gives Bessie a bunk for the night, but the cow has other ideas. Once fed, Bessie transforms into her true state and flies off towards Cleveland. There, Howard reads about the Vampacow's latest slaying and gets it into his head to help solve the crime. We are then treated to a truly remarkable origin for the Hell Cow, where the bodacious bovine is transformed into her new state by no less than Marvel's Dracula himself. Later that night, and the streets are abandoned, save one curious raincoated figure. Turns out it's Howard, who's hatched a plan to bring the killer heifer in once and for all. Only things don't go as planned, and the duck ends up thrown through a window of a hardware store, where it looks like his number is up. 
Bessie, however, misjudges her leap and ends up with her fangs embedded in a white wall. Begging her forgiveness, Howard tearfully dispatches the cursed cow. Mere moments after the deed is done, Tompkins and his partner arrive, responding to the alarm. Unwilling to accept what they see, the cops depart wordlessly, leaving Howard alone once again. Now, this is a great little story. Its brevity and rapid pacing only adds to the overall atmosphere. Steve Gerber manages to stay on track, delivering a nice and concise tale without any excessive editorializing. Frank Bruner's artwork is a dark joy to behold. Ably assisted by Tom Palmer, the two conjure the sort of gritty hellscape that hell cows really need to thrive. Now, I'm not the biggest Howard the Duck fan, but I consider this story a high point for both the character and comic horror in general. It's quality stuff. I'm Jason Mink. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if it really blew the doors off your tomb, please consider throwing a few bucks in the old guys who like old comics tip hat. Anything you contribute goes towards producing the kind of content that you can only find here on the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics Network. As for me, I hope to see you next midnight at breakfast! <laughs>